Hi friends, hello. My name is Robert Mahar and I am very happy to welcome you to Craft Friday. This is Spoonflower's second annual creative alternative to Black Friday and I am delighted to be presenting to you again this year. And I am especially excited because I'm being joined by 13 other amazing creatives from around the globe who have all been hard at work preparing free DIY tutorials just for you. So whether you are watching me on the actual Craft Friday or watching this recording at a later date on Spoonflower's YouTube channel, know that 13 other amazing projects have dropped at the same time and are waiting for you to check them out. Now, the intent with these projects really is to give you the structure and excuse to sit down and craft with or for family and friends this holiday season, and I hope you'll take advantage of it. Now, for my part, I have been thinking a lot about holiday decor that is not only aesthetically pleasing, but maybe has a certain amount of functionality to it or even an organizational bent. And I keep thinking back to when I was a kid and we would travel to visit friends and family out of state at Christmas time. And it seemed inevitable that no matter whose home we went into, there was always some sort of Christmas card display. Sometimes it was relatively small, other times a little bit more elaborate, but I presented myself with the challenge of what would it look like if I took this nostalgic 1980s Christmas card display that lives in my head from my childhood and updated it to maybe a little bit more modern aesthetic, something that matches my home decor today. And what I landed on was a simple cut and sew project that is created from a single fat quarter of Spoonflower's lightweight cotton twill. Um, it is uh, held up with a hanging structure at the top. There's some embroidery embellishments, and obviously the stars of the show are these little wooden clothespins along the edges, and that's what allow you to secure photos and cards from family and friends for display. Now, I have created this project in six different design variations and three different colorways. And the colorways were inspired in part by Spoonflower's recent release of um, solids from their Petal Signature Cotton line. And I picked out three of my favorite hues. There is a sage green, a sky blue, and a poppy red. And I thought that if you were going to tackle some other holiday projects this season, maybe some throw pillows or stockings or what have you, this is an easy way to make sure that the colors all coordinate. Um, I will tell you that this project in total, depending on the level of embellishment and detail that you add, can take you anywhere from an hour and a half to an entire afternoon. Um, the time frame is really up to you, but the reason I mention it is, is because our time here together today is a little bit limited, and I'm not going to be able to walk you through it in real time, although we'll cover all of the steps. Um, so I am going to treat this almost as if I were doing um, a live presentation on social media. So any uh, instructor errors, shall we say, will be um, uh, acknowledged and filed away as um, learning lessons, but I hope that you'll bear with me. Um, when you order your fat quarter of Spoonflower fabric, this is what it looks like when it arrives. It has a very obvious front and back panel. Let me get it right side up for you. They are denoted in the salvage edge along the top, and it also notes in the middle which of the um, signature cotton solids that uh, it coordinates with. And you'll see that the cut line is a dashed black line. Um, so when you get this and you're ready to start your project, I would lay it out on your work surface. And when I do this at home, I'm always working on top of a cutting mat, and I usually will bring in my trusty rotary cutter and a clear acrylic ruler. Um, I just find that these make really quick, neat work of this step of the process, ensuring that I've got nice straight lines. But please know that if you don't have these as part of your craft toolkit at home, um, you can very easily complete this with a sharp pair of fabric scissors. Um, once you have cut out the front and back panel, I would recommend steam ironing it with a hot iron. We just want to start with a smooth, wrinkle-free surface. And then you can set the back panel aside. And let's talk about the front panel for a minute. You can see it's a relatively simple design. I've picked a, um, a lovely swoopy script font for the word joy along the top. And then it's flanked on either side by... Um, 
two sets of three vertical stripes. And in my mind, these are all just an invitation to embroider. Um, if you have followed my work for any length of time, you know that I love taking a printed spoon flower fabric and embellishing it with embroidery. But I have to tell you this, this is, as much as it pains me to say, a completely optional step. If you do not have the time frame or the holiday bandwidth, and believe me, I've been there, to complete this step, you can forge ahead with this project, sew it up, and you're gonna end up with a beautiful card and photo display. But I really do recommend doing the embroidery. I think it adds a nice textural element to it um, and just really makes these printed um, components on the front panel pop. So um, I will tell you that if, like me, you benefit from um, having some written instruction in addition to the video, I have prepared on my website, which is robert-mahar.com, a complete um, written blog tutorial that has all of the steps from A to Z and photographs to go along with each of them to kind of reinforce what we're going to be talking about today. Um, this is not really an embroidery tutorial, so if you are new to embroidery, I've also embedded some great um, short format video tutorials in that blog post that will walk you through this. Um, but let me tell you what I did for mine. I decided that for the, the text, for the word joy, I wanted to do that in a whipped backstitch. Um, most people are familiar with a standard backstitch. It's a really core embroidery stitch um, that creates a beautiful, bold, graphic line um, that stands out nicely. But I decided I wanted to take it to that extra step and, and whip it. And basically what that means is taking an additional length of whatever um, you're sewing with. Now, in this case, you've got options uh, a standard six strand embroidery floss um, or a pearl cotton, which is what I used here. The primary difference between the two, six strand embroidery floss, you're able to separate those strands so that you can create a thinner or a thicker line depending on what you're stitching. Um, pearl cotton is just thicker by very nature and it's got kind of a rope-like quality to it. I just decided that's what I'd like to stitch with in this beautiful acru color. When you take an extra length of the floss, though, and weave it through your back stitch, it creates this really kind of lovely, tactile, thick rope quality to it, and that's what I was looking for. So once you have completed stitching up your text in the back stitch, all you need to do is take a length of pearl cotton or embroidery floss, if that's what you're working with, I usually cut a piece that measures about from my elbow to the tip of my finger, which is 12 to 18 inches. You're gonna come up next to the very first stitch in your line, and then from that point on, you're weaving it through the stitches on the surface of your fabric. You're not going in and out of the fabric itself. So what I'll do just by way of demo is I'm gonna come up next to the very first stitch in the J for joy, and I'm gonna turn my needle on its side and slide it underneath that first back stitch. And then I'm gonna do it again in the second and third and so forth. Um, again, you're always entering it from the same direction. I'm going from right to left. And as I weave it through, it creates a much bolder graphic line and a really pretty rope-like texture. So I hope that you'll explore it. Again, there are video tutorials that show these specific embroidery stitches um, in the blog post that is on my website. Now, for a, a little bit of additional um, embroidery, I decided in these three bands that sort of, um, of vertical stripes that flank the word joy, down the center stripe, I wanted to do a little bit of couching. Now, couching is a great embroidery technique. It's a stitch that allows you to incorporate thicker fibers, like this beautiful jumbo yarn that I found, um, into your embroidery. This would normally be too thick to stitch in and out of the fabric, but what couching is, is taking your embroidery floss or pearl cotton and stitching around it, securing it to the surface of your fabric. If you think of it almost in, like a, a fabric stapler that secures it at regular intervals along its length to make sure that it is secure on the fabric, you're doing that with a needle and thread. Um, what I would recommend when you are doing this is to cut a length 
of your thicker fiber that is two inches longer than your panel on either end. So it's going to extend beyond the front panel by two inches at the top and two inches at the bottom. And one way, kind of a little workaround or a hack that you might want to consider is to lay out your fabric and then take some fabric glue um, and create just a thin bead of glue along that center line on the front panel and lay your um, thick yarn over the top of it, press it into place, and just give it a few minutes to dry up. What this is going to do is it's just going to secure it for you while you're stitching, and then you're going to take your, um, your embroidery floss and your needle, and you're going to enter from the back side. You're going to come up through the surface of your fabric, and you're basically stitching over the top of the yarn and re-entering next to where you initially exited the fabric. And it kind of what it does is it cinches it into place and it's gonna hold it there nice and neat for you. Um, because it will be a little bit visible where it sort of cinches up that yarn, um, it's nice to do it at regular intervals so it looks intentional and well thought out. Um, what I will often do when I'm stitching or couching a long length like this is I will pull out my trusty ruler and I'll lay it next to it and I will take either a disappearing fabric ink marker or um, one of those markers that dissipates with heat. I think they're called friction, F-R-I-X-I-O-N. Um, you can find them in any sort of office supply store, but it allows you to go along and just make a little dot every inch along the way. And that gives you a point to aim for when you're stitching and doing the couching work. And then once you're finished, you can see you've just kind of got those, those neat little cinched crimp marks along the, um, the yarn, and I just think it adds this really nice, almost wintry texture. When I look at it, I think of, you know, winter woolens or, um, you know, cold season clothing, um, a little bit like a cable knit sweater, and that's why I liked incorporating it into this project. So my friends, once you have completed any of the embroidery embellishment that you want to do on the front of your panel, it is time to um, set this aside and we're going to do a step on the back panel and let me show you what that is. We're going to be looking at adding some hanging loops to the top and the bottom of the back panel. Um, you can see that there are three loops along the top and there are another three loops. That was a little wonky there, but there are another three loops along the bottom and um, this allows us to um, not only um, have a dowel in the top so that we can hang it, that dowel at the bottom just adds a little weight so that the display will hang um, nice and straight. Uh, your hanging loops can be created from a variety of materials. I recommend either using some cotton twill or some grow grain ribbon. And um, I also would recommend either three quarter of an inch width or an inch width for these. And you're going to cut out six pieces because we've got three loops across the top and three loops across the bottom. And you want to cut them out in a three inch length. So go ahead and cut those out in advance. And then what I like to do just to make sure that they are nice and secure is I'm going to go back and tack them to my panel with just a little bit of fabric glue. Um, this assures that they're not going to shift when we're machine sewing the perimeter of our panel. And so I'll just take a little bit of fabric glue, dap it there. I'll measure out a point in the center of the panel and glue my first ribbon there. And then I'm gonna measure a half inch from either side and place those ribbons in place. So I'm just gonna take this, I'm gonna put a little bit of dot of glue there. I'm gonna line the end of my ribbon up with the edge of the fabric. Put that in place a half inch in, press that down with your finger and just allow that to set for a second. Then what you're want, going to want to do to complete the loop is to then add a second dot of your fabric glue, just a little bit, fold the other end of the ribbon up to create your loop, and then what I would recommend is taking 
a little fabric clip. Um, I stopped using pins for the most part a couple years ago. I just got tired of poking my fingers all the time. These little fabric clips have been a godsend and you can kind of clip it into place and it'll cinch it and secure it there for just a few minutes while the glue dries. If you don't have fabric clips, I know you've got these little um, clothes pins that we're gonna be using later in the, in the project and you could just use those to hold it in place as well. But essentially, again, what this is gonna do is it'll look like this when you're finished. Um, all of those loops just sort of glued into place and ready to sew. Once you have them all completed to this degree, we're going to lay our panels together. And I am gonna take out the front panel from my embroidery hoop, just by way of demo, set this aside, and we're gonna lay them face sides together. So the front of my panel against the front of the back panel, you wanna line up all of those edges and then you want to clip it all in place. Pinning is fine if that's um, what you have on hand, but I usually like to use these little fabric clips and clip it liberally. Um, there's nothing worse than um, sewing a project, getting to the end of it and realize that um, your, your panels were misaligned. So go ahead and do that. Clip it all the way around the perimeter and then we're gonna machine sew it. So you wanna get out your sewing machine and we're gonna be sewing the edges with um, a quarter inch seam allowance. And the trick to this though is remembering to leave a little opening in one end so that we can turn these panels right side out when we are finished. So what I will typically do um, I'm showing it to you right side out, but if you imagine this pinned together, I would start sewing um, just to one side of one of the outer loops, so all the way around, and then finish up just on the other side so that this center section is open. And I will show you, I've pulled together that step for us. So I've gone ahead and I have machine sewn the two panels together, leaving, of course, that opening at the end, it's still clipped together. I'll take those clips off. And what you'll wanna do is open this up and this one remaining little loop that hasn't been sewn, do an eighth of an inch, like as close to the edge as you comfortably can and stitch that into place. It will get sewn again, but this just assures while we're turning it right side out that it doesn't get ripped out or, or knocked off. Um, one other step you want to do after you have sewn this as well is to take your fabric scissors and clip the corners. You just kind of want to clip off that little bit. It removes just enough of the excess fabric so that when you turn it right side out, you can um, get a, achieve a nice square corner. Um, turning it inside out is something that you need to do gingerly, especially if you have um, added some embroidered details to the front um, because you don't want to snag those as you are doing this and rip out any of your stitches. Um, the opening may be uh, large enough that you can put your hand in there and start to pull some of the fabric through. And in doing this, um, your panels will get a little wrinkly and we'll address that in a second because we will iron them smooth again. I'm going to pull this all the way through. And one thing that you might want to use as an aid, I've got um, a wooden weaving needle. Um, perhaps you've got a, um, a knitting needle or a chopstick or even the, um, the handle of a spoon. Um, and you want to run it along those interior seams and use this to kind of help turn out your corners so they're nice and square. And do that all the way along the edges of your seams. And then, once you have done that, roll those edges in your fingers. This is just kind of a method to um, neaten up the seams and to make sure the fabric is even on either side. And then take a hot steam iron and go all along the edges. You want to press that out. Um, I will say that if you did use a grow grain ribbon for your hanging loops, um, be cautious when ironing around them. It is a synthetic material and it will melt with a hot iron, so you want to stick primarily to just ironing your fabric. Um, and I stitched this one up also so you could see an example of what it would look like without the embroidery. It's still really attractive, would still make a really nice wall hanging. Um, and for the opening at the end that you have left unsewn, turn those 
those um, edges in a quarter of an inch and iron them so they're nice and straight. And then you're gonna run this back through your sewing machine and do a straight stitch just from one end to the other to secure that opening closed. So at this point now, we've got nice, neat hanging loops at the top and at the bottom. And so we want to now secure some closed pins. As I mentioned before, these are um, what will allow us to um, secure all of our photos and our cards in place. These closed pins are one and three quarter inch long. I found mine online. I've also seen them in craft supply stores. And you can use the same fabric glue that you used when you were tacking down the ribbons and um, the yarn for couching put a little bit along the edge and then we're going to position them in this little space between the stripes and the edge of the fabric and I think it probably would be helpful just to make sure that they are even on both sides that you get out your ruler and one of those disappearing ink markers or even just lightly in pencil and mark your spacing. Um, you can do anywhere between five to six clips per side comfortably, and I would recommend probably having about three inches um, between each of them. So I've got about three inches between the, the bottom of this clip and the top of the next one. Um, you'll run a little glue along there, you'll set it in place, and then I would just recommend letting it sit until the glue is completely dried. And depending on what fabric you're using, it'll say on the um, the manufacturer's instructions on the back what your dry times are, um, just to make sure that they're nice and secure. Um, and note that should these fall off at any point um, during their use over the years, absolutely easy enough to glue them back on again. Once you have all of your clothes pins pinned along the edges, what we want to do is address the dowels that hang in the top and bottom loops. And what I've done is uh, I've just found some 12 inch long dowels at uh, the craft supply store. They also sell these at hardware stores in varying lengths. Um, 12 inches is a little bit long, although it would be perfectly fine if you wanna leave it as such. Um, I decided to cut mine down to 10 inches in length so that uh, there wasn't as much excess hanging off of the edges. And I gotta share with you one of my favorite new tools. This is a little Japanese hand saw. Um, it is um, readily available online. It wasn't expensive. And the thing that I love about it is it cuts on the pull motion versus the push motion like most Western saws do. So if I kind of, if I were to mark where I wanted my cut to be, um, you know, and I just pull, it's going to do it in just a few pulls. And it does a really nice, neat cut. Um, if there are any splinters along the edges, you could just take a bit of sandpaper to it, but it makes really quick work of it. So Japanese handsaw. Um, once you've done this, we want to add some eye screws to the end. The eye screws allow us to secure some hanging twine to display it on our wall. Um, let me pull these in. I've got a little jar full of them. They are tiny little screws that have got the screw threads on one end and the other end is a perfect little hoop um, that we can thread some of our fiber through to hang it up. Um, the wood is soft enough with these dowels that you can just screw it in by hand. Um, if you need any extra assistance, you can always take a pair of needle nose pliers to hold the eye end of this screw as you screw it in. Um, and then once you've done that, you've got the perfect place to thread through some cording. Now you could use um, embroidery floss, you could use pearl cotton, you could use some of the nice chunky yarn that we used for the couching, or what I found was this leather cording. It was in the uh, jewelry making section of the craft supply store. And you can simply thread one end through and create a little knot. And the cording is thick enough that that single knot is going to be enough to secure it in place and it's not going to come through that eye screw. Um, visualize sort of the length that you want and then give that a little clip. Where are my scissors? There they are. Give that a little clip. What you'll want to do at this stage though is feed that through your upper loops on the front of your panel like so 
add in that second eye screw and then tie in the other end of your cording. That's gonna secure it in place. And then once you have done that, you can add in your second dowel through the bottom loops and you're pretty much ready to go. Um, the bottom loops, full disclosure, uh, they probably aren't 100% necessary. The weight of this lightweight cotton twill is enough that it's going to hang nice and straight. And especially once you have the added weight of the pinned um, cards and photos on the front. But I like the symmetry of having it at the top and the bottom as well. And then you are ready to hang it up and display it wherever in your home that you would like. And I tried to be conscientious with this design of not making it specifically a Christmas project because I think no matter what holiday you celebrate, if it gives you a little bit of joy and you've got people sending you little bits of um, lovely snail mail and you want some place to display it, this is really a great option. And my hope also is that perhaps this is an evergreen piece of your home decor um, that doesn't get packed away with the holiday decorations because I can see this um, being used for class photos or artwork from your niece or nephew or grandkids, um, love notes, any way to display those little bits of, um, uh, I don't know, just uh, communication, love notes, uh, photographs from family and friends, things that remind us of those connections that we've got between people that we care about, I think is a really special thing. Um, so my friends, we've come to the end of our tutorial. I appreciate you spending part of your Craft Friday with me today. I hope that you enjoyed our time together and I hope that you'll tackle this project and make it uniquely your own. Um, I wish you um, good health. Uh, please be crafty, be safe and have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you so much for joining me.